Today's World Insight, the China-EU Virtual Summit underway. What's in the cards for near-term relations between China and Europe? And the race against time for a safe and potent COVID-19 vaccine amid worries of the second wave in cold weather. The chief of the Chinese CDC gets us up to speed on vaccine research. We say any mutations at the moment, now they would have an effect on the vaccine under development. Hello and welcome to World Inside on CGT and coming to you live from Beijing, I'm Tian Wei. We start today's program with China-EU relations. Chinese President Xi Jinping co-hosted via video link a Monday meeting with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, whose country currently hosts the EU's rotating presidency. Also in the meeting are European Council President Charles Miguel and the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. President Xi said China and the EU could work together under four principles, peaceful coexistence, openness and cooperation, multilateralism, as well as dialogue and consultation. They sought to speed up investment agreement talks with an eye on wrapping up negotiations, hopefully within this year. Both cooperation and frictions have effects on the ties between China and the EU, two of the world's biggest trading partners. In face of a COVID-19 pandemic, both sides are looking to strengthen coordination. For more on the China-EU virtual summit, we are joined by a very strong panel in Brussels. Fraser Cameron, a senior advisor at the European Policy Center in Brussels. In Beijing, Adam Dennett, Secretary General of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. Also joining us in Beijing via Skype, Wang Yiwei, Jean Monet Chair Professor, Director of the Center for European Studies from Renmin University, of China. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. A lot of information to digest at this moment. We know that there might be also some press conferences given by parties participating earlier in the virtual summit. So let's go into some of the discussion on the key issue. Mr. Cameron, given the latest information and press uh, release, uh, what do you make of the summit so far? Well, the three key issues are cooperation on the pandemic, moving forward on the investment treaty negotiations, as you said, hopefully by the end of the year, and climate change. These are the three big issues, and the indications are that uh, both sides do want to make progress on this, but we haven't actually seen the, the final outcome. There won't be a joint communique, but both sides are going to give a press conference in the next half hour or so. But I think both sides before the summit let on that this was rather important, not a breakthrough summit, mm -hmm. but a, a summit whereby both sides would indicate they do want to make a deal. Right. They do want to make a deal, and we see the deal or deals have been ranging from what Mr. Cameron just put it, two multilateral issues. One is climate change, certainly that's multilateral issues, and pandemic, of course, prevention control, also multilateral. And also, meanwhile, there's a bilateral investment treaty that is under discussion. Uh, Professor Wang from China, what do you make of the result so far? I think it's where China-EU relations in a crucial time because the United States enforced the European Union to take sides, a uh, so-called decouple and the so-called new Cold War. So whether the world will be make progress or return to the Cold War scenario, I think the European Union's uh, strategy decision making is uh, very highlighted in the Chinese uh, agenda. And China-EU uh, as a two civilizations uh, now have a new defi uh, definition for uh, multilateralism and uh, to uh, make progress for the globalization. It's not just Asian civilization, it's Asian modern civilization. I think that's uh, President Xi uh, uh, reiterated. Okay. So China and the EU need each other. China and the EU uh, should work together to make their world, to get the green recovery and also to deal with the pandemic. That's, been, I think, very important signals. How to make, uh, Mr. Dennett, uh, independent strategic decisions for the EU at a time of uh, great crossroad, uh, put it in the word by the Chinese president, and also be able to work for its own benefits and on a multilateral uh, agenda for the world. That probably is a test for the EU. 
for the business world too, right, Mr. Dennett? Sure. I mean, the, the EU is making its own independent decisions, and probably the best example of that is its engagement with China on both the CII, CAI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, or the BIT that you referred to, and the geographical indicators. I mean, on, on both these issues, we've seen significant developments uh, this year. The signing of the geographical indicators today uh, shows that the EU and China can work together. Mm. Working together is extremely important. It's not only a, just about the continent, but also, also about the spirit, given the fact that we are having a very divided world these days. And Mr. Cameron, earlier there were trips made by top U.S. officials uh, to some of the European capitals, which has been categorized by most of the European media as, quote-unquote, anti-China trip. So, uh, Mr. Cameron, to what extent do you think the European capitals and the Brussels together be able to, once again, make that what they call independent strategic decisions? Well, I think the EU has no interest in joining a potential second Cold War fronted by the United States and China. I mean, the EU foreign policy chief Borrell made it quite clear this week that he wants to follow the Sinatra doctrine, the EU will do it my way, mm -hmm. i.e. they will do it on their own terms. So that's quite clear. But certainly trust has been eroded over the summer because of the events in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. And therefore, there is certainly, I would say, a toughening of the overall EU approach towards China. And that's why it's really important to move on and get further agreements along the lines of what was done today in geographical indicators mm. because the proof of the pudding is in the eating and if we can get results I think that will help change opinion. Mm. China and the EU, Mr. Dennett, if I could be frank here, have always been have some differences regarding you know human rights issue, or political systems, or ideological issue and both sides recognize that but the issue is not about these differences but rather attitudes to work on differences that's probably even more important diversity is the issue we are facing today uh, any part partners in any relationship have uh, differences in certain areas. Mm. So, Mr. Dennett, how will this have an impact, I mean, the spirit of being able to work together on the BIT, which we talked about intensely regarding the business community, and the CAI, uh, given your insider's information, quote unquote? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you, your question, I think, demonstrated it well in that it's a very complex relationship. So there are areas where we are working well together on the geographical indicators. That's a success. I think this morning also there was an agreement to create a new mechanism on energy exchanges at a vice premier level, a climate change dialogue. So, so that's good. But the CAI, as Mr. Cameron said, the proof is in the in the eating, so to speak. Uh, that has been going on for seven years now. There's been 30 rounds. We're hopeful that something could be uh, agreed upon by the end of this year, but it's tough. Um, mm. we, we've got a long way to come, and quite frankly, there are differences of opinion, as, as you say, in terms of our systems and the level of openness that we see here in China. So we hope that this buzzword of reciprocity uh, can be implemented within this agreement, particularly in the area of financial services, where we still have companies here in, in China that aren't able to operate on, at the same level or with the same openness that Chinese companies can operate in Europe. And therefore, it gives the, the word that reciprocity, which has been raised by certain politicians uh, in the EU, uh, an interesting one, isn't it, Professor Wang, because we have seen as a result of geopolitics uh, regarding the trans-Pacific relationship, investment from China into the European continent have been uh, facing some challenges, not to mention in the technical world, such as that concerning Huawei and some of the others. So, Professor Wang, from China's perspective, how to see reciprocity? Well, fortunately, the uh, European Union not identified China as a developing country. Uh, even identified China as a superpower, uh, it's a competitor, not just a, a partner. So it doesn't mean uh, reciprocity. Uh, what uh, the European Union opened the market to China, and China should do at the same level, uh, even further. So that's in Chinese understanding. It maybe it's unfair because we are a developing country uh, in a different stage of development. 
And the second meaning, I think, that from the European Union side, actually it's difficult to have the real reciprocity uh, principles with China or the United States, because the European Union is not a single country, it's not a sovereign state. Even though the uh, European Union now pursues so-called uh, the European sovereignty, mm. uh, strategic autonomy and digital sovereignty, uh, it's not a state, it's not a single uh, state. And China and the United States is, uh, is a, a state, and mm -hmm. China is even a civilization state. And thirdly, I think the European Union said uh, starting independence from the United States, from China, is a, a still a long way to go, uh, given uh, that the European Union uh, security is starting not quite independent. You know, there are uh, many alliances of the United States, uh, the NATO, the security, and most importantly, they don't have uh, independent search engine like Google. Okay. And also, they don't have the uh, industrial power uh, policies independently. So it's uh, hard for the European Union to be really independent and start in autonomy. Mm. Mr. Cameron, is that an aspiration rather than a reality? Well, it's always been an aspiration. I mean, Professor Wrong is right in terms of the EU being 27 member states with different histories, traditions, etc. But as regards China, I think they've been remarkably united in the past couple of years. Obviously, some countries like Germany have a far more intense economic relationship with China than others. But the policy that was agreed last year, which recognized the EU-China relationship is being complicated. On the one hand, we are partners in many areas. Mm. We're also competitors in some areas. And of course, the criteria that uh, upset some Chinese was systemic rival. That was related to global governance issues, different perceptions, for example, of multilateralism. So it is a complicated relationship. The EU is, I think, more united than it has been before. But we have to go ahead and get results. We can't ignore one of us or the other. We are two mm. of the most important mm. powers in the world. That's a great point I should take uh, also to bring it to you, Mr. Dennett, that the differences does not mean we just sit by and look at these differences and say, huh, what can we do about it? But rather to recognize it and work with a spirit that... Uh, can-do spirit, as they say, interestingly, in American culture. Uh, mm. Mr. Dennett, about the business area, which I want to uh, pursue more details with you, uh, how much do you think uh, there is really there in terms of a concrete common ground regarding multilateralism, regarding rules, uh, regarding how the economy might function, especially with the threat of the pandemic, and regarding, you know, how technological world can still advance despite of a geopolitical fight uh, between China and the United States. Mr. Dennett, from the European perspective, how do you see all of this? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of questions in there, but um, let me go back to, to business. Um, and sure. uh, b business, business wants to do business. A lot of European companies like have invested that. in China. Exactly. Business wants to do business. Go ahead, yeah. sir. And, and Chinese companies want to go abroad in, in certain circumstances, perhaps we can and we can work well together in, in doing so. But um, one of the biggest issues we're facing this year is the, politi the politicization of business. And that's really unfortunate. What we're all looking for is stability, predictability and transparency. And again, I go back to the CAI because those are some of the key objectives in this. And you know, if, if, if governments can deliver to business, um, an opportunity for them to do better business together, th they'll do that. We're, we're, we're supportive of, of, of both governments in coming up with a, a robust deal. But what we don't want is a, a political deal, which is just for a signing. We want it to be real and we want it to be meaningful. And we want to be able to demonstrate to the rest of the world, like we've done with Japan, like we've done with Canada, like we've done with Singapore, that we can sign a significant bilateral trade or investment agreement and that businesses and people can, can benefit from it. Mm. Great point. Uh, Professor Wang, also about that, it is, should not be just a political deal. It should be a real business deal, BIT or CII. And same to the other agreements that might be reached between China and the EU or European countries. It should not just be a political deal. It should be much more than that, much richer than that. Uh, first of all, of course, it uh, should be the economic uh, deal uh, because they have their own, own uh, logic uh, cannot be had external force. But however, uh, political life is unavoidable because politics and economy always combine together. It's not just the European politics. 
uh, not populism rising in Europe, uh, nationalism also rising in Europe, uh, protectionism also rising in Europe. Uh, sometimes I think uh, uh, political issues uh, now be related to the United States. You know, everybody, uh, even not mentioned, but the uh, United States is elephant in the room uh, because of the, uh, the real summit postponed to, to wait for uh, not just the BIT negotiation result, uh, but also wait for the result of the American president's election. Uh, particularly for the uh, uh, Europeans eager to wait uh, Biden to be the next American president to pay more attention to Europe. So the United States even watched very closely to the negotiation progress. So any uh, promise that China gave to the European Union, the United States will add more. It's like a double entrance uh, negotiation. Mm -hmm. So which makes China so very difficult to uh, uh, to reform our uh, like uh, state owned enterprises, uh, substitutes, or all uh, sustainable development, and uh, even uh, labor rights. So that's they make this more complex. It is a complex time. Uh, it is also a, a issue of timing. So many different kinds of timing. There are European political agenda and the calendar, American cross. Uh, Atlantic agenda, cross Pacific agenda, China's own uh, economic and political ag uh, agenda and calendar. So, uh, Mr. Cameron, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about just before the storms or before the big results, uh, some uh, a temporary discussion between China and the EU, or do you think uh, from the EU side uh, also that we are looking for some real, long term, sustainable? kinds of uh, agreement and consensus? Well, everyone in Europe wants a, a long-term stable relationship with uh, China. I mean, the, the immediate neighborhood of the EU is not encouraging at the moment. If you look at what's happening in Belarus or the Eastern Mediterranean, Borrell described it <coughs> the other day as on flames. So we want some stability in the world. We're not getting it from the United States at the moment, and it remains to be seen that Biden will win. I think uh, Professor Wong's right. 90% of Europeans probably do want Biden to win and try and come back to some kind of semblance of the global rules. But the world has changed. And the, it is important that the United States, China, and the European Union have a kind of equilibrium because they are the three biggest trading powers in the world. And we have to work not only bilaterally, but through the WTO as well. We have to get back to a properly functioning multilateral trade system. And that's also under discussion today, and I think it's important that the EU and China move forward together on this. Mm. One of the things that the uh, all sides have been talking about, including at the UN uh, Security Council, when we see a general uh, actually assembly, when we see a vote over the weekend on COVID-19, two opposition votes coming from the United States and Israel. However, the rest of the international community do come on a consensus regarding prevention control and some of the other issues uh, such as uh, uh, vaccine. So to a certain extent, uh, Mr. Cameron, if I could just briefly follow up, despite of challenges to multilateralism, we see the world has been gradually waking up at least on some of the urgent matters. Uh, what message do you think these kind of multilateral consensus could stand to China EU's capitals for the two uh, to consider and to work on? Well, politicians like to use the world rules-based international system, but often they don't really define the terms. We can all uh, make speeches saying how we're all wedded to multilateralism. We actually have institutions, including the, the UN, the WTO, yes. and they've not been functioning as well as they should be. So I think it's important to not talk about new institutions, but saying, well, why? What's wrong with them? Why are the big powers not putting the weight behind them to make sure they work? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to have this dialogue. We know what the position of the Trump administration is, but that may change after November. So let's, hope, let's be prepared for that, and let's hope that the EU and China can also reduce the number of differences they have in some of these big international issues. Mm. Mr. Wang, Professor, recently I had a talk with a former Assistant Secretary of State of the U.S., and he was talking about, in his personal view, two layers of issues the U.S. has with China in terms of technology and science advancement. One is China has become such a competitor and even rival in some of the key areas. The other is China has been so much strongly participating in 
coming up with the latest rules because technologies are changing fast. That while the U.S. has been practicing mainly withdrawing from international platforms, so. Uh, of course, uh, the two trends, China cannot prevent it. It's just a natural process of development, uh, given what the U.S. position, particularly these days. So, Professor Wang, under these circumstances, how much can you see in terms of China and the European capitals, including with the EU, be able to work on both on the international rules and then also on uh, technological collaboration on the grassroots uh, uh, real results? I think there are three basic uh, differences between the European Union and the United States, uh, particularly for the uh, technology. Uh, firstly, uh, the European Union's uh, transfer of technology to China is more than the U.S., uh, Japan, and any other partners combined together. So because the U.S. is a very religious country, they want to dominate to control this kind of technology. Because uh, since the industrialization, okay. so all the uh, industrialization 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, they all be Western uh, powers, mm. and then now be the U.S. allies, and more rely on the United States. And then the industrialization 4.0, and the 5G is the call, and the China, uh, Huawei, take a leading role, which is not U.S. allies, not uh, the Western country, and Americans want to dominate, so that be challenged by China, right. by the new technology. So now the European Union is different with, uh, uh, with, the, with the United States. So the okay. European Union not want to dominate. They want to set the rules, but not that they are occupied and dominate. Secondly, uh, United States is uh, number one, they have hegemonic power. They think about China as a competitor and a challenger. They, they, they even, uh, from ideology, they cannot accept that, it's, uh, uh, that the socialist country like China can take advance in the uh, innovation of the technology, even as a Eastern uh, civilization. So that's the uh, European Union, either the different. Okay. Uh, with uh, the United States. And thirdly, the United States have a strong military alliance. They, they're challenged by the Huawei and by the new technology. So that's the European Union also different. So that's the reason we, we still pay high attention to the cooperation with the European Union on the technology transfer and the technology innovation. We are really running out of time, uh, but Mr. Dennett, I want to give you a 30 seconds, if you can, uh, to also respond to that. Um, well, uh, each uh, and every individual member state in, in the EU will, will make its own decision. Um, uh, what um, uh, Mr. Wang was saying, I think as well, is uh, there's issues here in, in China where European companies are concerned about the access that they're getting here. So there's a, a combination of, of, of political issues, of sovereign issues here, and security issues um, at play. So th this is a, obviously going to be a very hot topic for, for time right. to come, and I, I think on the agenda of, of today's discussion as well, probably. Adam Dennett. Fraser Cameron, Wang Yiwei, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us uh, on the latest development on the China-EU uh, Leaders Summit. Really appreciate it. We're looking forward to new information and new insights coming in. All the best for all of you. Thank you. Be safe. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program today. The race against the time for safe and potent COVID-19 vaccine amid worries of a second wave in cold weather. The Chinese CDC chief gets up to speed on vaccine research after the break. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight coming to you live on CGTN from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. Now let's turn to the COVID-19 pandemic. Last Friday, the UN General Assembly overwhelmingly approved a wide-ranging resolution on tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. Though the U.S. and Israel voted down the resolution, it was still a very strong show of unity by the U.N.'s most representative body. As concerns linger that vulnerable populations may face dual risks of influenza and COVID-19 in autumn and winter, scientists are racing to find a potent coronavirus vaccine. At present, some vaccine candidates have started phase three clinical trial with China contributing to the front runners. Four Chinese COVID-19 vaccine candidates have started the international phase three clinical trials, but to offer billions a safe and effective vaccine is a huge task for everyone. Initial limited supplies of an approved vaccine will likely be met by overwhelming demand. Earlier, I talked to world-renowned virologist and immunologist Dr. Gao Fu. He is the director of China 
CDC, Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Let's listen to what he had to say. If you look at the U.S. situation, some really wonder whether uh, at some point there's going to be herd immunity. Now it's a six million up compared to the overall generation. It's still a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. But are we heading in that direction? And meanwhile, there's debate about exactly what is herd immunity. Some say 10 percent of the population. Some say 20 percent. Some even argue about 40 percent. And some say it varies from one virus to another virus. So these are debates that we don't even know about the answers. How do we know that we will have the capabilities to deal with the virus? Um, I think the herd immunity is always an issue, and uh, there's a lot of debate and discussion over there. You know, of course, you are talking about recent data shows 10 percent or whichever percent, but it's not very high. Mm. But to achieve a herd immunity, you can either through the natural infection, like you know, people talking, people, everybody thought herd immunity is a natural infection. Mm. Leave the virus there and uh, dance with the virus, and then eventually a percentage of a population will get the immunity against the virus. That's a lot of people think this is the herd immunity. Mm. That's a natural infection. Uh, but also you can say that on the other hand, you can have the, by the vaccination. That's right. So by developing vacci vaccines, if everybody says oh, 70 percent of people vaccinated with a vaccine, you also can get the huge uh, herd immunity. So you're talking about 70 percent, seven zero, that's the number you're looking at for herd immunity through vaccine on COVID-19? Uh, we don't know the percentage. That's our estimate. We might need 70 uh, percent. You know, Where does virus, this number come from? You know, from uh, the transmissibility, R0, and also, you know, what we saw from the, the, the current data. I'll give you an example. For example, if you want to have a herd immunity for measles, you want over 90%. That's right. And uh, I know, remember we all had that, right? Exactly. So if you, you don't have the 90%, uh, the, the whole herd or the whole population cannot be protected. Mm -hmm. You might get a reinfection. But for this one, so that's from current data, for current transmissibility, we estimate, we might, I use the word, might, we won't need a 70%. Do we have cases in which countries already achieved or regions already achieved somewhat herd immunity, do we know? I mean, if we, ha if we had enough vaccine, of course, we should immediately get 70 percent people vaccinated, but we don't. So in this case, you know, it all depends. You know, this is why we are talking about we might have the urge to use the vaccine. Mm. It all depends on the special groups. People ask, do we need a vaccine? Mm. Should I be vaccinated? So I'm telling everybody, vaccine, the uh, population target, target population are normal or healthy. Well, let's put the healthy people. When you inject anything to the healthy people, safety, efficacy is a very important factor. You know, when you think about that, well, you know, you, are, you might not want to vaccinate everybody. In my opinion, the first group should be uh, the group who maintain the society running. You know, for example, policemen mm. and border control. Public service. Yeah, pub, all the public service, you know, service people. Do we have international standards that would tell layman people like me, what are some of the qualities that one ma vaccine must have before I agree to have it? So can you tell us more about that regarding particularly COVID-19? You know, it's not, not just uh, particularly for COVID-19 any vaccines, you know, you have to ha fulfill those three conditions, safety. Okay. You got to make sure you got, you know, everybody been uh, uh, ejected, they got a safe stuff there. And then efficacy. Hmm. You make sure, you know, I'm being va vaccinated, you know, it's, effect it's uh, efficacious for me you know, to prevent anything, you know. A third, quality control. Make sure you and me we were vaccinated with the same quality of the products. Mm. So safety, efficacy, and quality control. Every step of the way, we see new challenges. Mm -hmm. For example, Professor Gao, whether the virus mutates at what speed, you earlier touched on that, but that will be the key issue yeah. about whether vaccine we're developing today will still be eligible 
-hmm. for us once it developed and produced. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, what do you think? Yeah, well, everybody is worried about the mutation. You know, obviously the virus is mutating. As far as uh, the, the knowledge we have or the data we have at the moment, we don't see any mutations at the moment. You know, they would have any effect for the vaccine under development. I There's see. no evidence. Flu season. Oh, yeah. I don't want to mention about that, but that's a reality, unfortunately. Yeah. So we're facing, at a time, COVID-19 spread so fast, even faster than the earlier. And then vaccine being developed, not yet when it comes to the final result. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the winter flu season is coming. Now, the flu season also has its own vaccines, right? Usually, yeah. sometimes work, sometimes doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. so, it's a very complex situation, I think, for public health researchers like you. How would that all of these murky waters mixed together work? That's a big challenge for the public health at the moment. We are predicting we all have a situation or scenario, you know, COVID-19 mixed with flu. Mm. However, we have some evidence early this year because of the NPI non-pharmacological intervention. Mm -hmm. The flu um, uh, cases gone down. For example, people wear masks. Exactly. People are keeping social distance. Yeah. People are staying at home more, ho work from home. So all, all these contribute to that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is why, you know, though we are facing flu season, but because of the NPI, you know, mask and uh, uh, social distancing, all this there. But then here's the issue about Professor Gao, uh, whether we should wait for the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, coronavirus vaccine this time, and combine it with the flu vaccine, or we have to, we need to preferably have the flu vaccine first once it's available. So this could always be a question. Some suggest that, that probably the two can be combined by researchers once the efficient uh, coronavirus vaccine comes out. Uh, I do not know which is the best way. What would you suggest? Personally, at least in this season, I don't think we, we should wait for the combination because the, for the COVID-19, we still don't know, you know, the safety and the efficacy. Of the so we are we still, you know, but for the flu, at least we know it's safe right. and with some percentage of efficacy. I see. And also, you know, because of the, uh, the years, uh, we know it works and the quality control, COSE is good. I so see. for those three major a factor for the, uh, any vaccines. I, I encourage people to vaccinate flu first and wait for the COVID-19. Let's say, wait and see when and uh, anybody you know, who should be vaccinated. Mm. Another thing very important, talking about vaccine reinfection, because we have seen earlier, for example, some of the travelers, uh, they were in their hometown uh, infected with COVID-19, but then after they recover, they travel to other places, mm -hmm. and yet they were found infected again mm -hmm. with a different kinds of COVID-19 mm -hmm. strain. So here's the issue of whether reinfection mm -hmm. is going to be the real challenger for many of us. If that is the case, then the vaccines become extremely tricky. That's a very good question. Thanks to the science. Did I ask a good question to the scientists? Yeah, thanks to the science, you know, because of the size, because of the genomic sequence, mm -hmm. we can identify the virus for the initial infection and for the second infection. That's right. So that's the size. Without that, you know, you cannot know, you, even you were re-infected, you cannot distinguish you know, from the original infection right. to the second infection. Okay, that's the sunny side of it. I, I realize as a scientist yourself, you want to talk about the sunny <laughs> side of it and also the reality side. What about the reality side, the difficult part of it? Yeah, um, you know, we only have some cases. You know, a good example is from Hong Kong. That's already through the peer-reviewed journal, Clinical Infection Diseases, it's already published. Right. I think, you know, taking that case as an example, you know, um, the whole Kong scientists, they try to test for the antibody. Of course, that person, because of the second infection, they didn't see any, any antibody. Mm. That implies either this patient with the initial infection and uh, there's no immune response, no antibody, 
or the antibody declined to the level, you know, by the method we are using, you cannot detect. Mm. So or antibody for one strain of the virus, not necessarily antibody for the other strains of the virus. There were the moment, at least for the strain we did, uh, I think the Hong Kong scientists, they did the sequencing. There's no evidence. There's no, no evidence those of two. any Yeah, antibody. but the problem because the, oh. this uh, special or particular case, and he didn't show the antibody from the, you know, first initial test when they get this reinfection. I see. So, I think don't try to exaggerate too much about one case. Again, I want to leave the size to science. That's just a size. But, you know, there's no evidence for the population. Right. You know, when you are talking about infectious diseases, you've got to put everything at the population level. So that's very important for the public to understand, you know, what is going on. Tell me more about the global situation, prevention control COVID-19, things are still evolving as we speak. Yeah, as you know, in general, you can see, though we have experience in China, of, I call it five waves. So when you define the waves, that means you have the peak mm. and uh, always there, uh, you get it down. So this is why you know, from Wuhan to northeast uh, you know, provinces like Heilongjiang, uh, Problems. We have imported cases from Russia, mm -hmm. and then we have Beijing, Xinfadi, and then you have uh, um, Xinjiang, uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region, and uh, after that you have recent Dali outbreak. So mm -hmm. I call it the five outbreak, and it's we because we did uh, rigorous uh, control measures. It's done uh, that general in China, but we are still facing a serious problem by some importing. Uh, cases. So, mm -hmm. because in general, for the whole world, the pandemic is still there. And right. in some countries, due to the community level control, you know, the key for the control of this pandemic is a community, community right. level control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of that, you know, you look at in Europe, uh, in America, North and South America, it's still there. However, if you look at in some other areas, like in Thailand, mm -hmm. you know, they have very good uh, suppression strategy and it works very well. Uh, as far as I remember, in Thailand they have almost 100 days COVID-19 local transmission free. Mm -hmm. So that's a big achievement for Thailand as well. A lot of the Chinese cases, uh, if you look at back at some of the latest events related to, uh, for example, the seafood market. So there creates a debate about whether frozen seafood or imported frozen seafood has anything to do with what we are facing today. Because, you know, this debate is based on the fact. The fact is the fact. So, you know, that's very important. Cases, and they originated from some seafood market or mm -hmm. some, you know, meat processing factories. Right. So, it looks like the virus, the COVID-19 virus, will survive for a while or dormancy for a while in those areas, you know, very humid and especially for some, you know, extremely humid and low temperature um, mm. uh, uh, environment. So it looks like, like that. So we are doing uh, a lot of work for that to try to trace back. So where does the virus come from? So that's very important. Any new development on that? Um, we are still working on it. You know, for example, why I, I call in China, we all have five waves because the virus from Wuhan and the virus from Beijing, Xinjiang, Dali and northeastern countries, when you do the genetic sequencing, the genomics tells you they are different. I so see. because they are different, this is why I call the five waves. When you talk, you are talking about you know those um, humid uh, seafood uh, market. So it looks like so there's some direct link mm. there. Of course, you know we cannot get any conclusion whether or not the virus is transmitted through the food. Mm. No, there's no direct evidence and no solid data yet. But that's the environment would help the virus replicate, help the virus dom uh, dominate there. When you are talking about the differences in genome, are you talking about strains or are you talking about specific genome designs that existed there? Yeah, it's strains or clades. You mm. know, when you, you know, coronavirus um, is not like a flu or any other virus, they, have, they, they are very diversified. Coronavirus in general, it's very conserved. Mm. It's not that as uh, diversified as the flu. So only you know trace amount of the difference. But by doing the 
NGS or you know net generation secrecy, yeah. you can identify the difference among different origins of viruses. This is why, you know, you look at what happened in China, we can see the difference for the virus. Another thing is if you look at the global issue, Professor Gao, very sad I would say. Yeah. In the United States today, it's already six million. Mm -hmm. That's just one country. If you look at India, uh, 80,000 daily newly reported cases. Mm -hmm. What kind of dire situation are we really facing as a human being today regarding COVID-19 now? Oh, well, you know, when I was asked some question like that, you know, why we are in cultural nature covered of, you know, looks like could very clever virus. You know, the virus has a lot of uh, hidden characters. If you take all the knowledge we know about the virus, you know, this virus tells us mm -hmm. or teaches us a lot of new knowledge. So, you know, that's exactly, you know, if you borrow any knowledge, you know, take any knowledge even from flu or any other like SARS, MERS, mm -hmm. so this is a totally different virus. I, when I say different, totally different means the characteristics of this virus. So, so this is why, you know, the human beings we have to, I call, the, quote, dance mm -hmm. with this virus. You know, while we are controlling this virus, meanwhile, you know, we have to learn from this. So this is why I call the, the relationship between mm -hmm. the virus and the human beings. My interview with Dr. Gao Fu. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, you can search the name of our program, World Inside, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and also my accounts as well. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.